No, I will never bash Africa. You know, I sat next to a lady in the, in the plane. She was an American. And, um, and she said, flat out, she said, I'll bash uh, my U.S. when I'm within the U.S. But outside the U.S., I will <laughs> never bash the U.S. That's what everybody else does. But Internally, we talk as children. But Africans don't do that. We don't. We're actually the mm. ones that take the negative news to them. To them, exactly. It's stupidity of the highest order. And as soon as you start preaching positive about your own oh, continent, no, 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 no. Ah, you've been then paid you to must say. Be, yes, and you must be with the government. Is, They're <laughs> always against the ruling party. It's not about the government. We support whoever is in power. After the Berlin Conference is putting in place a system to make the Africans believe that everything African was bad and everything European was better. We suffer from the legacy of colonialism. We automatically feel inferior when faced with our Caucasian brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. That is something that we as individuals need to deal with. Mm -hmm. It so goes to how we are going to make decisions about Africa when we are faced with them. So yes, in some cases, we have not been good negotiators for Africa. We need to do better. We need to wake up as Africans and realize that we are just as good as anybody else. Uh, and when we come to negotiating for Africa and getting rid of those boundaries, the issues you are talking to, you are right. We should have addressed them. 55 years later since OAU, there are issues our Pan-African fathers spoke about in 1963 that we are yet to address. I, we are yet to attain that perfect African Union. Yeah. Our solution to truly removing corruption out of Africa is when Africa speaks mm. with one voice as okay. one continent, and we are there. You know, um, white supremacy and the fact that we were being called black and they're calling themselves white, I call that lie number one. It is just such a blatant lie they are not white, we are not black, and yet, for centuries, we have failed to denounce the lie. What is wrong with us? <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. And yet, that lie has such profound effects, subliminal messaging all around. We just know that we are inferior, you know? We just know that we are not as, as, as beautiful as they are. Somehow, we are programmed to just take second place. You know, it's like one of those cases where the front door is open, but we feel more comfortable going through the back door. Those kind of things, we do them without thinking. We are automatically just giving, taking second place yeah. when we could take first place. In the grocery store, if a white person is behind it, go ahead. The brainwashing is so deep that we have to be in the present, we have to, to be consciously aware of what we are doing and constantly check ourselves. We did not end up of this mindset overnight. Hmm. It's gonna take a lot of undoing over time. And that means one has to be conscious. One has to accept the fact that they are suffering from the legacy of slavery and the legacy of colonization. colonization. If you don't accept that you're suffering from this ailment, how do you begin to heal? It's like me as a doctor. I can't help you as a doctor if you don't realize you're sick and you come to me. So first is acceptance that we are suffering from these two conditions. And not only are we suffering from them, we are in the intensive care. I think a lot of Africans feel so inferior because they don't know their history. They don't know their history, but also they've just been told. Back to the line number one, you are black and you're ugly. It's everywhere. So it's not even they don't know. They're just automatically they're living in a world that just says, you are second class, you are inferior, you know? And we have never really done anything to denounce that lie. So if you don't know your history, where we are sitting right now, right. this is a replica of Great Zimbabwe. <laughs> and Great Zimbabwe was built by our ancestors, right? Correct. And you see, I think she put mortar, but <laughs> our ancestors never used mortar. This alone should make you feel like, should make you feel superior. Because even they were doing research trying to say that no, it was not done by Africans. 
So this is how Africa is need to know that you need to travel more within Africa just to discover yourself, just to know that yo, you are not what they tell you that you are. When I went to Great Zimbabwe, I felt so proud as an African. But you know what though? We could start with our history books. Why are we still using colonial textbooks in hmm. 2022? You see what I'm saying? They used the books, the educational system, hmm. to brainwash us. It's going to take the educational system to undo the damage. But I'll tell you the place where they need to really take responsibility is religion. It is religion that was used to brainwash the African. And it's going to take religion to also undo it. Why do we go into a church and see a white Jesus Christ? No. We all know Jesus Christ was a black man. That's a fact. In fact, I like to say Jesus Christ was an African diaspora, <laughs> born in the Middle East, <laughs> grew up in Egypt. That's the definition of an African diaspora. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> that comes to my next question. What is the main function of ADDI? African Diaspora Development Institute. <laughs> so Jesus is your number one. <laughs> This <laughs> number one no, African no, no, diaspora. No, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> number one African diaspora. <laughs> well, what is the function, main function of the ADDI? To mobilize African diaspora to participate in the development of Africa. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem, far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one. We have the six regions of Africa. We got the six regions of Africa, which is just an entity that's just by name only. What do you mean? Can you say six region is like ECOWAS? It's like SADAC? What does it mean? Where do you go if you want to go to the six region? I thought they had an office in Ghana. Huh? Where? Okay, I've seen an office in Ghana, which um, it's ADDI. Uh, not, not ADDI, but the, it's an office for the SIS region. No. The SIS region has not been officially uh, approved as a decision by the African heads of states. All they have done is to approve it and made it a part of the constitution. That's it. I'm so confused because I went to the launch of the African diaspora flag, though. So. I mean, I have to do more research about that then. There are processes in which the African Union works. You, can, you are a smart man. You can look them up yourself. <laughs> <laughs> One person doesn't get up and decide they're going to do something without consulting the people. Consultation with the people is important. What do you think it will happen to Africa if the African diaspora decide to invest more in Africa? That is the only solution. What I tell um, uh, the Africans, the African diaspora, is that we are the true gold. Hmm. We are the true gold. You know, the reality is people don't realize as we speak, there's not a single African country that has the capacity to build an airport, capacity to build a railway line. But collectively, as the continent, we have all the expertise we need, but each country is trying to look within its country, and when it cannot find the expertise, they go outside, outside the continent, because we are not united. It will even be very difficult for them to find engineers next door, because we are not united. So my hope was that the AFCFTA would begin to put us together, bring us together, in a way that access to professionals is, is, is easier. But that's not happening. So ADDI is saying we have expertise galore. Black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize 
as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there. Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering, we pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it... I use the example of the uh, airport in Atlanta. Hmm. The busiest, probably most beautiful airport most well-run airport. It was built by majority, 50, over 50% 50 black people. Uh, Mayor Maynard Jackson of uh, Atlanta back then, when he was commissioning the airport, a lot of white uh, businesses came in and they were putting in their proposals and he realized there were no black companies. They said, well, where are the black companies? They said, we can't find them. So he pushed the papers back and said, hey, I'm not signing this until we find some black companies. Hmm. So they had to go find them. So it's, that's how black people ended up participating in building the Atlanta airport. Why aren't we getting them? They're still there in Atlanta. Why aren't we getting them to come and build airports in Africa? None of the airports are built by black people because we're not united. So ADDI is saying, let's have some way that we can all come together, we all speak with one voice, and we can all build the Africa that we want together. So we prevent being exploited. I was in Zambia and uh, I saw one Turkish man with a big apartment complex that he built. Now, that's, how does a young man from Turkey decide I'm gonna go to Zambia hmm. and I'm gonna make money? These units are 100% booked, Average rent is 3,500 to 5,000 a month. This Turkish man flies in, he has a manager. He's making money out of Africa. And I said to myself, why can't African diaspora do this? Other people are seeing what Africa has, but the diaspora cannot see what Africa has. You don't think the diaspora complains a lot? Yeah, we do. But why do we complain about Chinese people coming in? I know, when we are not When there. we are not coming. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it I, think, I think there's this thing I need to tell people, man. Wherever there are people complaining a lot, that's where the opportunity yes, is. Are. Absolutely. But yet, when Africans get so comfortable with life in the US, life in um, Canada, Europe, and they start saying that there's nothing in Africa. I think you, you've built a successful business in Africa. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think there's a lot of people that have moved back. We need to look at the opportunity because when you are in the diaspora and you come back, you have, when you come, you see so much opportunity. And I think that, look, sometimes it's not about you working alone. It's about you partnering with somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can't do it alone. There are businesses, there are young entrepreneurs here who just need investment, who just need somebody with your expertise. All you need is investment from somebody in the diaspora to come and partner. We need more partnership. That's how we're gonna grow. But you know what, with ADDI, those who are members of ADDI, the conversations have changed. The conversations have changed. But those who are not yet aware, they complain. That's all they do. <laughs> Somehow they expect change to come to Africa through osmosis. They want to complain from 10,000 miles away and they want somebody to build an Africa that they, they want, want that looks more like the West so they can just waltz in. What they don't realize is it's happening. Africa is moving forward, except we don't own it. The outsiders are owning those nice um, uh, grocery stores that you go in and they're well stuffed with everything you want, hardware stores with everything you could ever think. I can live a life in this country like I live in, in, in America, but I, we don't own it. Who we owns are just, it? Who owns Africa? You see, you got to understand that when we were under colonization, the companies that ran the economies of all African countries 
were companies that belonged to the colonizer. If a country was colonized by the British, the majority of the companies that controlled the economies of those countries were British. If you were colonized by the Germans, German countries, German companies. If you were colonized by the French, French companies, and so forth. That, my brothers and sisters, they never give up. They still continue to control the economies of their former colonies to this day. But the opportunities are still there. There's still room, plenty of room for African diaspora to come in. In spite of the many years of exploitation and abuse, the statistics are telling us that they've only exploited maybe 10% of Africa's natural resources. And every day, we're discovering more and more African natural resources. So we are inheritors of an amazing, amazing continent with endless riches. Mm. If we can just wake up to realize that. And it doesn't take much to invest in Africa. There's so many low hanging opportunities and our people are being told, don't go to Africa. You went to Bordeaux. Yep. yep. Would you think you are in, in, in Zimbabwe? I, no. White people everywhere. I was in Victoria Falls, same thing. But Africans are being told, yeah. don't go to Good. Zimbabwe. Yeah. Don't go to Africa. Hmm. No, they want to keep Africa to hmm. themselves. Yep. And we're stupid enough to listen to their yep. narrative hmm. and believe in them. Hmm. And then not only do they tell us, don't go to Africa, they want you to be the mouthpiece to bash Africa. No, I will never bash Africa. You know, I sat next to a lady in the, in the plane. She was an American. And, um, and she said, it flat out, she said, I'll bash uh, my U.S. when I'm within the U.S., but outside the U.S., I will <laughs> never bash the U.S. That's what everybody else does. But Internally, we talk as children. But Africans don't do that. We don't. We're actually the mm. ones that take the negative news to them. To them, exactly. It's stupidity of the highest order. And as soon as you start preaching positive about your own oh, continent. No, 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 no. Ah, no. you've been then paid you to must say. Be, yes, and you must be with the government. Is, They're <laughs> always against the ruling party. It's not about the government. We support whoever is in power. Period. Because at the end of the day, they come and go. But the people and the programs must continue. And we, the people, as private citizens and private sector must make sure that those programs continue. But we just like to complain. And that is another serious disease, which again now says, when it's all said and done, in spite of all the other issues and factors that come into play for us to be where we are today as a people, when it's all said and done, it goes down to you and the image in the mirror, your mind. You see, a, a, a free mind, a, a mind that is free of colonization, it doesn't matter where you take me. Mm. If my mind is clear mm. and I can see clearly, mm. you cannot use me to destroy myself mm. and my people. What qualifies one to join ADDI? You just have to be an African. All people of African descent. You must be a person of African descent. Just uh, before I go, you know, you, you didn't tell me anything about you. You're born and raised in Zimbabwe. Born and raised in Zimbabwe. Which part of Zimbabwe? Chivu. Where is Chivu? Chivu is in uh, Marshallland East. Oh, okay. Yes. You, yes. So you, you grew up here? Grew up here. I left soon after high school to go to college. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've been out of the country for 45 years. Um, married a Ghanaian, and so I'm a very proud Ghanaian wife. <laughs> 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 I said, when it came to husbands, I knew it go. <laughs> I get in trouble with Zimbabwean men for that. <laughs> but also, there was a study that, she, that said that uh, Ghanaian men made the best husbands in the world. No, that's, that's a fact. Yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> I have to agree with you. <laughs> so, which is the call came from the Ghanaian one? That's the Ghanaian one, yes. Mm -hmm. I was live growing up in Zimbabwe. I think, I believe that it was 45 years ago during right. apartheid. And that's what really saddens me. When you see young people, you even hear some young Zimbabweans say, life was better during Ian Smith. If you had something like that, no, yeah, I, people will talk like even that. Even to today, I yes, hear it. Yes, life was better during Ian Smith. Are you kidding me? When you were only able to be either a domestic worker 
um, if you're lucky to become a nurse or a, a primary school teacher. That was it. Then the rest, farm worker. That's, that's were the only options. You couldn't go to college. You were not even good enough to be a bank teller. That's how bad things were. We were relegated to, to the worst parts of the countries where you, no rains, you couldn't really do any meaningful farming. They pretty much had us cornered. And you call that because you were able to, to, to have a bag of milli meal and have your sadza every day, you call that life. Even the ones who are complaining the most, they are the doctors and the lawyers and the accountants, they're all these professionals. You couldn't be doing any of those things during Ian Smith. Some people died. People don't realize it took a few young men, bold, awoken young men, to get out of their hut and say, if I go east in this direction, I shall end up in a country called Mozambique that is sympathetic to my cause. I'm risking my life. I'm leaving my family. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to learn how to fight. And I'm going to come back and defend what belongs to me. If I go north, I'll end up in a country called Zambia, Tanzania. And so young men left with nothing but the belief that things cannot continue to be the way they are. Where are those young men? It is those young men Many died, did not come back, but they made those ultimate sacrifices. So to want to insult them by telling them life was better with Ian Smith, that is sad. And you are where you are today because of those young men and women who risked their lives to liberate Zimbabwe. Where are we going wrong? Why are they not getting this? We are now in what we call the fourth War of Liberation, the fourth Chimurenga in Zimbabwe would call. The first Chimurenga was when the British came and the Mbuya Nehanda's War of Resistance. The second one when the young men and women went into the bush guerrilla warfare. The third Chimurenga for Zimbabwe is when the War of Liberating Our Lands. And now we are in the fourth Chimurenga, which is the economic liberation. And they have to realize for us to be economically liberated, it takes unity, it takes understanding. Clearly being submissive to those who have always abused us is not how we are gonna to get to the promised land. Our people must wake up. Hmm. And for them to wake up, they need a serious conversation with the image in the mirror. Your final message to the youth of Africa. The youth of Africa, please wake up. Africa is yours to take. Africa is yours to rule and manage. But for you to do so, you must understand your Africa, understand the issues and what's really going on. But above all, protect yourself from being used as an instrument of your own self-destruction. Guard yourself because you are red meat when it comes to the West and their desire to destroy and exploit and control Africa through you. The question is, are you willing to be used? Are you going to be one of the few brave men who came out of Zimbabwe, out of Mozambique, out of Namibia, out of South Africa, out of Angola, out of Algeria and many other African countries to say, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm going out, I'm going to learn how to fight, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to defend my turf. Are you one of those? So my desire is to see all of us Africans wake up and defend our turf. We have an event in October. We have an event in October. Um, as you know, I've been traveling in Africa the past six months. Okay. I went to seven different countries looking for a home for ADDI. And uh, I ended up in Zimbabwe, which was the last country that I thought I would end up in. Um, 
But during my travels, I met with a couple of presidents and a um, couple of uh, former presidents. And one in particular, I was challenging them as to what is this all about the sixth region? You only proclaimed all people of African descent living outside Africa, which still is not correct because you're making an assumption that I have the same privileges as the African-American, which is not true. I am an American citizen, but I'm also a Zimbabwean citizen. An African-American only has one citizenship. They also need a citizenship in an African country. Mm. That's how we equalize the playing field. Mm. So what were your plans and how are you intending mm. to, to, to equalize this? Mm. And that, that's when this uh, you know, former president said, well, we did our part. We incorporated the sixth region into our constitution. And now it's up to you, diaspora, to organize yourselves. And we need a meeting, a representative uh, sample of diaspora from every corner of the world. Mm. They must come, you must find a host country to host you, and you meet, you deliberate on what you want. If you tell us what you want, we'll be happy to approve it. But it cannot be just one small organization here. He even mentioned a couple of uh, people, and he said, no, it has to be people from everywhere, every corner of the earth. He said, Ambassador, if you can call that meeting, I'd be happy to get my own president to, to host that, uh, that, 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 that event. Then he took me through the whole history of the Pan-African Congress, mm. going back to W.E.B. Du Bois and, and the first five PACs, um, and then the sixth PAC in Tanzania and the seventh in, in Kampala, uh, and then the aborted eighth in uh, South Africa and then Ghana. Um, but he said, suggested that we could hold a ninth Pan-African Congress, but focus on the sixth region, where you guys tell us your demands. Mm. But the important thing is get people from all over the world. If we can get that sample, find a government to sponsor the event, that government can then deliver your demands to the other heads of states at whatever summit they wow. will present it. Wow. That's how we can actualize the sixth region. So I was armed with knowledge and I was very grateful for all that information uh, that he gave me. So I went around calling and talking to diaspora, uh, sharing with them what I had been told and a lot of people got really interested. So by the time I got to Zimbabwe, I decided to have a conversation with the uh, Zimbabwean government and uh, President Nangogwa agreed that uh, the gov they were comfortable with the country sponsoring uh, the, the Pan-African Congress and also I have my own desire to see diaspora come to Africa and see and appreciate the opportunities. So it's going to be a combination of that conference as well as Invest in Africa Spotlight Zimbabwe. Mm. So that's going to be held in uh, Victoria Falls yeah. from uh, October 14 to 19. We're hoping to really just have a group of diaspora from all over. It's not one organization, it's from all over. People are coming, they're representatives of different organizations to just have a conversation. What do we want as, as a people living outside Africa? As is, nobody can claim the sixth region because yeah. <laughs> it hasn't been commissioned. Um, they haven't made a decision on it because we have never brought anything to, to, uh, to, to the heads of states. So anyone can attend? Yes, uh, strictly yes, yes, on yes, invitation. yes. No, it, it's, it was out. We just sent it out. There was a question here. One fills out and we are submitting the names to the government of Zimbabwe. It is the government of Zimbabwe that will send out the letters. Okay. All right. So I guess if you're As long as you're of African descent, of course. Yeah. So <laughs> if you're watching this video, probably we're going to get a link so that you all can uh, fill up if you are interested in coming. And am I invited? You are definitely invited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are very proud of you, okay. especially that you are an African youth who is awoken, who is enlightened, who gets it. We hope that more and more young people can emulate you and realize that Africa is going to be built by the Africans. The good, the bad, and the ugly, we must own it. That is our Africa. We can no longer <coughs> continue to bash Africa. If you don't promote Africa, then who are you? And I'm telling you this, I will never bash Africa. 
we, you and I can have a conversation <laughs> about what's going on. It's internal, it's family. But I'm not going to go out there and just bash Africa. For what reason? For what reason? There's so much good out of Africa. I've chosen to highlight the goodness out of Africa. That's it. Let the others who want to spend time bashing Africa, go ahead. There are enough of you out there. I have decided okay. for the remainder of my days, I am going to highlight the goodness out of Africa. Because you see, it's like two wolves. Yeah. The good wolf and the bad wolf. If you continue to feed the bad wolf, he just gets stronger yeah. and will destroy you. Yeah. I've decided I'm going to feed the good wolf. Oh. And that's talking about the good news out of Africa. And there's plenty of good news out of Africa. Ah, exactly. So, so that, thank you for your work. <laughs> that's exactly what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you. I, I still can't believe that I'm sitting down with you. And I hope and believe that there's going to be more conversations that we're going to have. Absolutely. Uh, probably one of these days I might invite you online for us to have another conversation like this online. Absolutely. And uh, I look forward to seeing you here in October. Thank you. Thank you.